Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful, sunny day it is today, isn't it? It's good to get up to the sun, but it's better to have the sun inside you than the one up there, right? Because he is awesome. He's an awesome, awesome, awesome God, and we love him this morning. And we just welcome all those that are online, wherever you may be today. We welcome you to River of Life Assembly in the good old Miramichi in New Brunswick, Canada, wherever you are today, we welcome you and we ask the Lord to bless you and look after you. Well, today is a very special day. It's the first day of Advent. And, <clears throat> pardon me, and some people don't know this, but I'm just going to give a brief, brief counter of this. Advent is the purpose of ourselves and the church in prayerful expectation for the coming of the Messiah. Advent looks back upon Christ's coming in celebration, while at the same time looking forward in eager expectation of the coming to Christ's kingdom when Jesus, the Messiah, returns for us, his people. So Advent is a good time to set aside and focus more on Jesus. It's a good time to reflect on how much we need a Savior. A good time to begin to wait on the Lord more. Also, our hope in God can be refreshed and our joy, our peace, and our love for God, family and friends restored. So yes, Advent is important. And we're going to have our first a reading for Sunday of the Advent. <clears throat> this morning we begin the celebration of Advent, and this is a time leading to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning we will be lighting the candle of promise and hope. The prophet Isaiah spoke of Jesus' birth 700 years before Jesus was born. In Isaiah 7:14, the Bible declares. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child, and he will, she will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Again, in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we have this promise. For unto us a child is born, to us a child, 
a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So at this time, I'm going to ask you, Shirley, to come up and light. You want to come, Paul, too? You barbecue much? <laughs> Good. Would you light the blue candle, the candle of hope? So, Father, today we thank you for Advent. And yes, Lord, we are looking forward, forward to the coming of the Messiah. God, we just pray for our country right now. We pray for all the people of any country, of all nationalities, languages, color, races. God, we just uphold the whole world needs hope. If there's anything the world does need, it's hope. So, Father, we thank you for that. We pray for all those in our congregation are not here. I think of Mike this morning home, that he needs prayer. And Teresa, we pray for their healing, Father God, and all those other people. That, that are here and all around those that are listening we pray a blessing and healing on you and we thank you for this in Christ's name Amen Yeah. 
Amen. I need you more than ever before. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here today. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was just told that our online program, we've invested $5,700 more dollars in it. And that's to make me look better. <laughs> and it can do it all for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Also, I, I'm preaching today on help wanted. And, and one of the things that we need, and you can see Trina, I'm always recruiting her for things. You can see her at dinner, at lunch, whatever you call this thing downstairs after. And we need voices to voice ads for Christmas time, for Life Radio. Life Radio is a wonderful ministry in the Mamershi and also around the world. And uh, I was looking this week, and uh, so far we have 61 people who are interested in advertising on Life Radio this year. Isn't that great? Uh, uh, say, I, uh, there's something going on here. My mic isn't working or something. <laughs> 61 companies, great companies in the community. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, I like that list to be out there because, you know, it's a big thing to support. Every day 
we boom into the atmosphere, all the great songs of worship and praise. And the enemy tries to work in the atmosphere, the God of this world, the, the prince of the power of the air. He liked to work in the atmosphere, and we just keep it saturated with positive songs and positive words and good things all the time. How many are listening? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so pray for Life Radio and pray for the people who are on air all the time. Trina leads a worship here on Sunday morning and she leads it in the rest of the city all week long. Isn't that amazing? I'm not sure you're hearing me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She leads it in the rest of the community all week long. Think about that. That's fascinating, isn't it? And so we, have, we are finding more and better ways of spreading the gospel all the time. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18 to 20, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. He saith unto them, you think about it, you think about it. Just now, somebody from India come up on my screen here saying they're watching. Isn't that nice? Fascinating. Praise the Lord. I, I don't always just watch who's watching. <laughs> I have to preach too. I get caught up in all kinds of stuff. Anyway, he saith unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Follow me, follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And, and they straightway left their net and followed him. We have been studying the footsteps of Jesus, and we've been talking about his going into Galilee, and then going into Judea, and then going back up to Galilee. And, and last week we looked at his message we talked about the six things that he proclaimed. How many remember them all? <laughs> the six things that he proclaimed that he was come for. He was, he was come to, to set free those that were bound. Isn't that great? To open the eyes of the blind. This, this week, I have to tell you a little story because it's kind of in my spirit, the little story. I, I was at work and, and somebody said to me, do you work for God? And I said, yes, I work for God. And they said, well, you can't do much. There isn't a God. And I'm, I said, well, I'm pretty sure you're wrong. I was just talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I was. The God of this age blinds people so they can't see. And you can't be mad at somebody if they can't see, can you? We talked about that last week, and that's not the sermon today. Anyway... Today I want to talk about the method that Jesus used of getting the gospel out. If you look closely at the Bible, you will find that this meeting they had in Galilee was not their first meeting. When Jesus was down in Judea, uh, Andrew was following John the Baptist, and John the Baptist introduced him to Jesus, and he went and got it, he walked back up to Galilee and got his brother Peter and brought him down and introduced him to Jesus and said, we found the Messiah, and it was a big event. And now, they, then they went back up to Galilee, and Jesus went in and cleansed the temple, and then he went up through Samaria, and you remember that story, I, I'm kind of repeating a little bit from a couple of weeks ago, uh, where he met the woman at the well, and then he goes on up into Nazareth, and then he goes, they kick him out of Nazareth, and he goes on up into Capernaum, and at Capernaum, they're fishing. We have people here that make their living fishing, and what a great life it is, and... and they were casting a net into the sea, and, and, and Jesus came along and called them to be fishers of men. And, and uh, John chapter 1, I'll give you that little illustration of where Jesus first met them. Verse 40 and 42, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what Jesus said, and he followed Jesus. And Andrew went to find his brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, and then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. And after a brief meeting, they went up to Galilee, and now Jesus is up there, and he's pursuing them. And we always say, 
that these were ordinary people. They were just plain ordinary people. But I think in saying that, we are really missing something. In a world where everything was upside down, they lived in a world where Rome had taken over their country. And when they took over their country, they really taxed and oppressed them hard. And, and that was the talk of the day. And remember when Jesus was born, they all had a register to pay tax to Rome. And it was a big oppression on their lives. But these guys saw something in Jesus that was bigger than what was happening politically. What do you spend your time talking about? <clears throat> Paul talks about the lifestyle they lived as the result of following Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and verses 8 to 12, he said, We are pressed on every side by troubles. How many want to sign up for that? We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed. We are perplexed, he said, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down. Was that a promise you got underlined? <laughs> we get knocked down. Isn't that amazing? That's what Paul said. We get knocked down. That's what I'm asking you to sign up for today. We get knocked down, he said, but we're not destroyed through suffering. Everybody say, through suffering. <laughs> through suffering. Our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. So, the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. He said, we put it all on the line. When Jesus said, follow me, he was saying, put it all on the line for me. The men and women who followed Jesus saw it as an opportunity. It was bigger than they were. They were able to recognize in the middle of all that was going on in their world, that God was doing something bigger than Rome was. They were able to see that. They were able to see a new kingdom taking shape that a lot of people were missing. And, and, and they were glad to be involved in what Paul just talked, talked about. And, and it was bigger than everything they had seen before, and they were glad to be part of it. Paul writes this to Timothy. He said, in 1 Timothy 1 and 12 and 14, he said, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has given me strength to do this work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him. He said, you know something, Timothy? He said, I find it an honor to serve God. I find the, the fact that God allows me to be involved and in an eternal kingdom. God allows me, me, to be involved in an eternal kingdom. Count it me trustworthy. Even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, in my insolence I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me. Because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Then he says this, you know, if you read Paul's life, he was beaten with rods and beaten with stripes and stoned and left for dead and shipwrecked. And he says this, he said, oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. He said, in the middle of all that's going on, God filled me with faith and love. These men, I'm sure, had no idea how big it was what they were in. They had no idea how big it was. They just knew something was going on and they wanted to be part of it. They heard Jesus say, there's a new world order now here. A new world order now here. And, and, they, say, and, and, and they didn't know what that meant. I'm, I'm sure they didn't know what that meant because in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, just before the ascension, it said, 
So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? They didn't know they were in, involved in something that was international, multicultural, and would go around the world and be in Mamershi today. They had no idea how big that what they were in was. I want to say this, because I really think this is important. Having the ability to look beyond what you don't understand is an amazing trait. Having the ability to look beyond what you don't understand with your mind is an amazing trait to have. All the people who do well in the kingdom of God have the ability to be willing to walk beyond where their mind takes them. And they have the ability to obey when they do not understand what's in front of them. The Bible says, for example, of Abraham, he went out not knowing. People of faith have the ability to look beyond what they understand and have the ability to walk in what they can't figure out that's bigger than they are. Follow me was the first part of the call. And it was a difficult thing. Following Jesus, even when he was on earth, was a very difficult thing. Listen to this. I hear them say in John chapter 11 and verse 8, his disciples objected. Jesus said, I'm going back to Judea. The Bible says this. His disciples ob objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? <laughs> like, are you a little bit slow or what's going on here? Like, he said, I'm going back to Judea. They said, really? <laughs> You're really going back to Judea? They tried to kill you the last day you were in Judea, and, and we all had to run for our lives. And, and you know, my, my French teacher told me in grade nine, she said, fool me once, shame on you. <laughs> fool me twice, shame on me. <laughs> so going back to Judea wasn't the smartest thing you could do, right? It's like, you know, they tried to kill you, stay away from there. And then there was this day. In Matthew chapter 16, and verse 21 to 23, it said, from then on, when, Je when Peter said, Jesus, you're the Son of God, you're the Messiah, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, he would be killed. But on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. He, Jesus is telling them this. Look, look at verse 22. But Peter took him aside. Peter, Peter, <laughs> took him aside. He took the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. He took him aside and began to reprimand him. <laughs> wow. For saying such things, heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Then Jesus turned to Peter and said, you know what he said? He said the same thing to Peter as he did to the devil when he was tempting him in the wilderness. He said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. You know what I did when I read that verse this week? I felt a big, deep inner compulsion in my spirit to go and read Peter's books. You know, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. So I, I, I did. I, I thought, I wonder if Peter got it. <laughs> Looks like to me he did. That, that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. You know, here you are in front of 11 other guys. They're all your companions, they're all your friends, and Jesus is saying, you're the devil, Peter. <laughs> Get behind me. You, you, you're totally wrong here. You know, that, that's a pretty big pill to swallow. What a, what a way to learn something bigger 
than that. Jesus used the same words with Peter he did with the devil. But Peter wrote his book, and, it, and you know, uh, it's a fascinating book, First Peter. First Peter chapter 4, for example, it says, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, this is Peter writing, you must arm yourselves with the same, what? He learned. When Jesus rebuked him, he got it. He said, you gotta, we, we got to have the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. He said, Peter wrote, in, you know, I, I, I read that book through four or five times, First Peter. Five short chapters. 2,476 words. You think I was busy this week? <laughs> Five little chapters, 16 times Peter uses the word suffer. You know why? He learned when Jesus said, Peter, that's how the devil thinks. That's human thinking. And it goes right along with the devil's way. He said, you got to be willing. you got to arm yourself for suffering. And Peter learned. Later, and you're reading in the book of Acts, and, and Peter is about to get whipped. He's about to get beaten. Now, now, I think about this. Because I run into people who don't like what I have to say sometimes. And they tell me. And I'm okay with that. I know where they are. They know where I am. That's okay. And Peter is in the spot now where, where a guy got a whip in his hand and he's about to beat him and say, okay, we're going to ask you again, what are you going to do? And Peter says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, the apostle Peter, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. And you know what that would mean? That he would be taken out and beaten with a whip. Peter would have to learn to cast your net whenever God says cast your net. If you're going to catch what God wants you to catch. In Luke chapter 5 and verse 5, it said, Simon and Simon Peter answered. Jesus said, okay, Peter, here's a carpenter from Nazareth, and he's going to tell Peter how to fish. And, and he said, okay, Peter, I want you to come out here and put your net down. And he said, just a second. He said, we fished here all night. Uh, exhaustingly. And caught nothing in our nets. But on the ground of your word, I will lower the net again. <laughs> Peter would have to learn that when everybody else says there's no fish here, that Jesus still thinks it's a good place to fish. <laughs> Hallelujah. There will come be times when God will ask you to do something that you will you are really sure won't work. That your mind has convinced you that's not a good idea. You shouldn't do that. There's times that God will ask you to do things that you've already tried and found nothing. But the word is, follow me. Follow me. Follow me sometimes means going against what your mind thinks. Boy, that's a hard one to learn. Peter would learn how to cast his net when the wind was blowing the wrong way. The first time, the first time that Peter would really cast a net for God was in Acts chapter 2. And this is what it says in verse 13 and 14. It says, but others in the crowd ridiculed them. How many ever got ridiculed for walking with God? Others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're, they're just drunk, that's all. Look at the next line. The next line is, then Peter stepped forward. Hallelujah. You know why he stepped forward then? Because he knew God was telling him, fish now. <laughs> this is a day to cast your net. This is a time to do it. 
there would be 3,000 give their lives to Jesus when Peter got up in front of people ridiculing him. That's a fascinating thing to learn. The moment you learn that, okay, everybody's against it now. Now I'm going to fish. It's a great time. The problem, I'm going to say this slower and with less loudness. The problem with waiting for the right moment is it never comes. The problem with waiting for the right moment is it never comes. Just because the sea is troubled doesn't mean I shouldn't fish. Amen? Just because the sea is troubled doesn't mean I shouldn't fish. I learned, (laughs) I'm a fisherman too. I, you know, I used to go, when I was, I shouldn't say this out loud, but when I was just a kid, a little kid in school, like seven years old, I'd go down to the river in the spring of the year and catch a fish before the bus came. You know what I learned? I learned that when the water is muddy, you just use a brighter fly. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lots of times in the world, the water is muddy. But the brighter I shine for Jesus, the more apt I am to catch fish. Hallelujah. The beautiful thing about following Jesus is he promises you success. In Mark chapter 10, in verses 28 to 30, it said, Then Peter began to say unto them, We have left all. Peter began to say unto Jesus. It's always Peter, isn't it? You read through the Gospels, always Peter. Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold. A hundredfold Now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Jesus said, everyone that left anything to follow me gets a hundred times back. Isn't that a pretty good investment? How many would invest in something you get a hundred times back? Three. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I wonder how many commented online. I'm hoping they're listening. If you believe, if you believe that the world is ultimately going to be taken over by the devil, if you believe that the gospel is not going to work, If you believe that darkness is going to crush us, if you believe that the church is the ultimate failure, don't sign up. (laughs) That's the wrong philosophy. If you you believe for a second that the devil is going to win this game, you're in the wrong, you're listening to the wrong voice. If you believe for a second that the church is going to dry up and blow away, you're listening to the wrong voice. If you believe for a second that there are going to be more people lost than saved. You're in the wrong game. The cross wasn't for nothing. When God sent his son from heaven to earth to die on a cross, do you think it was for five? (laughs) I was told when I was a kid, there was only eight on the ark. Could be less, go to heaven. (laughs) Dear God, (laughs) should I say such a thing? Jesus told them before he left in Mark 16, in verse, you might have to use your Bible today. In Mark 16 and verse 15, he said unto them, he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature. And then he said this, 
He that believeth. What does that tell me? They are going to be believers. <laughs> he that believeth. He that believeth and is baptized. There's going to be people. Take this and go with it. You're going to go and preach. And people are actually going to believe. And they're going to believe and commit and move on with God. Just think about it. That's your promise. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In those verses, I find a plan for success. He that believeth. And if that's not enough for you, listen to Matthew 24 and verse 14. I love that. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. In all the world. As a witness unto me, all nations, all nations, and then shall the end come. He said, we are going to win. You are guaranteed this gospel, that's God's plan for planet earth. This gospel shall be preached in every nation as a witness and then will the end come. Isn't that exciting? And listen to this line from an angel in Revelation 11 and verse 15. It says, the seventh, the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were what? Mighty voices in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shouting. The dominion, kingdom, sovereignty, rule of the world has now come into the possession and become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever for eternities of eternities. <laughs> I know how it's going to end. I don't listen to the rest of the world media, though. I read the Bible. When you read the Bible, guess what it says? The gospel will be preached in all the world, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of God. Amen. He made this world. It belongs to him. He runs this world. He has the final say over everything happening on planet Earth. This world has a pre-arranged destiny by God. The devil doesn't run the world. A pre-arranged destiny that God has already, pretty bold, declared. He has said in his word, this is how it's going down. Be careful. Don't listen to the wrong voice. It'll cause you to be discouraged. Listen to the word of God. 1 Corinthians 15 Verses 25 to 27, it says, Paul said, For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. <laughs> and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. I believe that when Jesus died on the cross and resurrected from the tomb, that the plan of God for planet Earth right then became a success. That is where it was all hell was destroyed, sin was rendered powerless, and death was destroyed. When Jesus came out of that tomb, I've been in that tomb. It, there's this little sign in there that said, he isn't here, he's gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. I read that sign in there by myself, just me and the little sign. And I said, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to worry about that stuff that all the world is worrying about. He is not here. He is destroyed the power of death. The day of the resurrection. You know, you, you, you get into reading about the cross and, and the Roman soldiers took a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they mocked him and put a robe on him and they beat him. And then you come to the day of resurrection. And this is what it says. The same guys, the same Roman soldiers. Matthew 28 and verses 3 and 4. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The same guys that crowned him with a crown of thorns three days before were dropping dead in front of him, fainting because he was resurrected and coming out of the tomb. And just, we're pretty sure we beat that guy to death. Look at him. They passed out looking at him. Hallelujah. John 
after Jesus ascended into heaven, John got to see him. John traveled with him all the time he was on earth. In Revelations 1 and verse 17, he said, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. <laughs> he said, it like, this wasn't the same guy. I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I have the final say, John, over everything. I am he that liveth, I was dead, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of hell and death. <laughs> no wonder I can get bold for God. <laughs> Down in my heart, I'm walking with the guy who's in charge. I'm walking with the guy who declares the end from the beginning. In the last days, God is putting together a group of people who are going to take the gospel to every person on planet earth. He said the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in every nation as a witness unto me. That's why we put money into video cameras and microphones because we want to be involved in putting the gospel to every human being on planet Earth. That's why we put up transmitter. That's why we, we go to CRTC and, and, and put ourselves on the line because we believe that the gospel of this kingdom is going to change the world. Amen. We believe that the gates of hell will not prevail against God's kingdom. And we believe that the last voice on planet Earth is going to be God's voice. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and it, it will be the final say on everything going on. As we speak, I looked this up on the internet. By chance, I ran across it this week. Uh, <laughs> as we speak, there are plans to meet in Amsterdam next June. A group of, of big evangelists are meeting together, and it's called Empower 21. And they are putting a plan together to touch every human being, all 8 billion on planet Earth. Hallelujah. And you know something? God has raised you and I up for this moment. You know what Isaiah said when, this, when the enemy comes in? Like a flood, the Spirit of God raises a standard against him. I'm here to tell you today, we're going to see young people come to know Christ, your children, your grandchildren. We're going to see on planet Earth great revivals, moving of the Holy Spirit, as God uses people like you. And there is a place for you in God's great organization. This, today, just today, I was doing what Jesus was doing. I was out recruiting. <laughs> if I come up to you before service, either run or get ready get, to be challenged. Because <laughs> I'm going to have some form of challenge for you. And you know something? God, Paul said, I'm all excited, he said, that, that Jesus thought I was acceptable to preach the good news, and so am I. The little guy from the other side of the river gets to do it. Hallelujah. I get to do it because God put his presence in me, his spirit in me, and he wants you. And he wants you full time. He wants you to commit to saying, I will put God first. And I will speak for God. And I will do what God asks me to do, whether it is popular or not, because I ultimately know how it's all going to end. I have a challenge for you. If you're interested in being involved in this great spreading of the good news on planet Earth, put your hand up. I want to pray for you. Father, <coughs> hallelujah. I want to be involved in spreading the good news to every creature. Lord, when you made me, 
You put in my heart an ability to do something for you. And I want to fulfill that purpose you have for me to the best of my ability. And I commit today that even when things are tough, I will follow you. I will walk with you. I will do what you ask me to do. I will speak for you. I will obey your voice. And Lord, I will be successful because you have caused a plan for my life that will make me successful. Jesus, use everyone with their hand raised right here this morning, this week. Use everyone, oh God, in the spreading of this great kingdom. You told us when we pray to say your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Lord, use us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you hurting and broken today? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is called.
church. And he's waiting for you. Just come to the altar of our God. He will accept you where you are, how you are. Even if you're a mess, he wants to pick you up, put you on his path of righteousness today. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he